Hello and welcome to this Japan Society webinar. My name is Bill Emmett and I have the honor to be chair of the Japan Society as well as to moderate many of these webinars on current affairs and business. I thank you all warmly for your support of the Japan Society and of these online discussions. This month, by a fateful coincidence, both of our countries will be preoccupied by the holding of state funerals, even if of quite different figures. But with all the issues of remembrance and of our constitutions and politics that they raise. But we also share deep preoccupations over the longer term about geopolitics, or more specifically, peace and security. As G7 countries, the UK and Japan are deeply engaged in and concerned by Russia's war in Ukraine, both by what this invasion by a nuclear superpower may mean for the European continent but also by what it may mean for East Asia. Prime Minister Kishida has been admirably clear about this, notably in his keynote address at the IISS Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore in early June, that, to quote him, Ukraine today may be East Asia tomorrow. Everyone knew that the country he most had in mind with that remark was Taiwan as well as the broader implications of the Ukraine war and the China-Russia strategic partnership on China's behavior. But then tomorrow came quite quickly, in a sense, when the Speaker of the US House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, paid a visit to Taiwan on August the 2nd, along with a group of other Congress people, and, led, and that led to not merely noisy protests from China, but also the largest and most intrusive set of military exercises around that island that China had ever conducted. Tensions, therefore, are running high. President Joe Biden has been keen to make it clear that in the event of a Chinese military attack on Taiwan, the United States would get directly involved in the defense of Taiwan, even though officially the US policy remains one of so-called strategic ambiguity. Japan's announcement of a big rise in defense spending in its new budget is in part to be dedicated to reinforcing its defense of the Japanese island chain nearby Taiwan, as well as the part its forces would expect to have to play in support of America. So where is this heading? How significant is this summer of tension for the future of Taiwan and of US-China relations? What could this mean for Japan and for the UK and Europe? To discuss those questions, I'm delighted to welcome two really experienced and knowledgeable scholars on the Taiwan issue and on regional security. In London, I welcome Maya Noans, Senior Fellow for Chinese Defense Policy and Military Modernization at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, IISS, of which, in full disclosure, I should mention that I chair the IISS Board of Trustees. Maya sent, spent part of her childhood in Taiwan, has worked for the EU External Action Service there, and indeed is about to jet off to the region, ultimately Taipei, for an extended visit. And in Japan, currently speaking to us from Hokkaido, but normally in Tokyo, I welcome Yasuhiro Matsuda, who is Professor of International Politics at Tokyo University's Institute for Advanced Studies on Asia. Prior to Todai, he spent 16 years at the National Institute for Defense Studies, which indeed was where I first met him. While Maya is about to fly to Taiwan, Matsuda Sensei has just returned from his own extended visit on that island. As usual, I will ask each of our speakers to make opening remarks of up to 10 minutes, following which I will lead a discussion and, most importantly, bring in your questions. As Matsuda Sensei is in East Asia and has just returned from Taiwan, I will ask him to start us off. Subject to the strength of his uh, connection to us from his Hokkaido hotel room, which obviously um, uh, is, a, is an issue outside our or his control. But we start optimistically, and I offer my welcome to the Japan Society to you, Matsuda Sensei. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um... Uh, firstly, let me express my uh, deep condolences to uh, Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth. Um, I, I think that uh, she's a very uh, great uh, personality uh, to unite the country and also uh, made a, a great effort to uh, 
uh, to uh, improve the uh, relations between UK and Japan. I think that uh, she will be living in our memory uh, forever. Um, yeah, we feel a, a great loss. Well, um, uh, getting back to the, uh, the, our uh, today's uh, topic, I have just uh, come back from uh, Taiwan just one week ago. And um, I, I also experienced uh, a Chinese uh, military exercise uh, on that island. So let me uh, uh, give a report to, uh, to, to everyone uh, about what I experienced in the uh, island. Um, basically, the society is uh, quite stable. Um, they are not in panic at all um, because uh, this time is quite different from uh, the, uh, the third uh, 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 Taiwan Strait crisis in, in the mid 1990s because the, the tension was, uh, uh, you know, uh, on, on the rise uh, uh, incrementally uh, compared to the, uh, that, uh, the, the last crisis. I think that everyone was a kind of prepared. And uh, China was not going to uh, launch a war. It is uh, uh, obviously um, uh, military intimidation, uh, that's all. And uh, also, uh, the United States and Taiwanese authorities were cooperating each other and uh, tried to uh, minimize uh, the tension in the society. So, in China, uh, Chinese media, Taiwanese media in Taiwan uh, didn't utilize the word crisis. Uh, uh, they use uh, the word uh, military exercise. So. Um, I think that basically the people are very uh, in a, a stable situation, but uh, the people in the authorities, gov in the government, and also experts were, uh, are expecting uh, more uh, serious uh, challenges uh, 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 from next year. Because next year, uh, uh, 2023, uh, is a very special year because uh, uh, Xi Jinping uh, is going to be uh, run for the third term. So it's going to be his first year uh, of his third term. And in Taiwan, uh, uh, there will be a presidential election. The election date is in, uh, is in the, uh, uh, January, 2024. So to, uh, next year is going to be a very uh, serious uh, competition between the ruling uh, DPP uh, pro-independence DPP, and also the anti-independence uh, Kuomintang uh, next year. So in that uh, situation, uh, the China has uh, sent uh, messages to the new administration. Uh, for example, in 2015, uh, uh, Xi Jinping met with uh, 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 President Ma ying in uh, Singapore. That was a, a big, uh, strong message to the next president, Tsai Ing-wen. If Tsai Ing-wen admits one China principle, uh, I can give you a lot of things, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, carrots, uh, uh, stable relations with the, the men in China, and uh, Xi Jinping is willingly to see you. Um, obviously, it, it didn't uh, go well, uh, and. In the beginning of uh, 2019, when uh, DPP uh, lost, uh, uh, lost uh, the local elections seriously, uh, at that time, uh, uh, DPP was not seen as the winner uh, of the 2020 uh, presidential election. So at that time, uh, Xi Jinping released a very important uh, speech saying that uh, we should discuss uh, the formula of one country, two systems, uh, Taiwan version of one country, two systems. We, we need to talk. Uh, Xi Jinping uh, 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 released this remarks to the Kuomintang because Kuomintang under Ma ying uh, was not that positive on the idea of uh, discussing a unification uh, with, uh, uh, with the communist party. Uh, basically, uh, Ma ying policy is uh, keeping the status quo. No unification, no independence, uh, no use of force. Um, but Xi Jinping was 
pretty much uh, uh, dissatisfied with my NGO uh, because next step should be uh, uh, the discussion on direct discussion on unification and the formula after uh, the unification. Um, you know, we have a kind of misunderstanding. Um, China's definition of status quo or is quite different uh, from uh, the rest of the world. Uh, uh, the definition of status quo of the rest of the world is simply maintaining uh, the, the current situation. Uh, China is divided into mainland China and Taiwan. And uh, both of them have governments, military, and they have different people and uh, different opinions and so on. And uh, don't fight. Uh, keep the uh, keep and maintain the uh, current situation. That's the, uh, the the status quo. But in China's um, official idea, status quo is uh, that uh, China is not divided. Uh, you know, unification has not achieved it yet. Uh, so every day, uh, both sides should um, uh, uh, moving forward to unification. That is the status quo. So if you uh, insist uh, that uh, keep the current situation, that is the, the, the violation of the status quo. Uh, that's uh, China's uh, uh, definition of the status quo. So uh, Taiwan should step forward uh, to the unification every day. Uh, that's the, uh, uh, the uh, China's uh, you know, definition of status quo. So um, the Kuomintang should uh, 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 go forward to the, the unification. And that statement uh, backfired in the Taiwanese society, in the uh, Taiwanese society, because uh, China was and is so unpopular. Uh, so um, that kind of you know, uh, compulsory uh, approach was uh, uh, rejected by the Taiwanese. And immediately after that, uh, the Hong Kong's turmoil uh, followed. And uh, uh, the Beijing has uh, violently uh, uh, messed up uh, the situation in Hong Kong. And then immediately after that, uh, the, uh, the pandemic followed. Um, and uh, lockdown in uh, Wuhan, and even Shanghai uh, was locked down, locked down. And uh, this uh, kind of counter countermeasures of the COVID-19 in China, uh, scared a lot of the, a lot of people in Taiwan because they understand Chinese uh, perfectly. So um, uh, the uh, approval ratings or uh, the the affinity toward China has sharply dropped from uh, in, uh, 2018 to uh, uh, th uh, through 2022. You know the older you know opinion polls show that uh, the China has become extremely unpopular. Mm -hmm in Taiwan, as well as the rest of the world. So actually, the peaceful unification through dialogue uh, is becoming more and more hopeless. And China, uh, Chinese authorities are uh, quite aware of this uh, reality. S but uh, for their political mandate, uh, you know, unification should be achieved. And uh, both sides should uh, step forward to, 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 to unification every day. So if the peaceful unification through dialogue is hopeless, um, there should be another way. Uh, that's uh, uh, what I call, uh, you know, compulsory peaceful unification uh, or a coercive, uh, uh, you know, uh, peaceful unification. Coercive and peaceful are contradictory to each other. Uh, it, it's not uh, peaceful at all, uh, but um, uh, China is heading uh, toward uh, this approach uh, to take many actions. So um, I think that uh, although society is very stable, um, the Taiwanese uh, government uh, and the military uh, are uh, preparing for uh, very serious challenges uh, from next year. Uh, Xi Jinping is going to uh, send a stronger message uh, to Taiwan uh, that without uh, the, uh, you know, 
you know, bluntly saying without uh, 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 in surrender, uh, China is going to take uh, uh, coercive measures. That kind of um, you know uh, uh, situation may occur anytime uh, in uh, the near future. Actually, uh, China doesn't have um, enough uh, capability to actually attack and occupy uh, the whole island of Taiwan. Uh, especially that is true uh, when uh, the risk of uh, US inter intervention exists. Uh, but on the other hand, China doesn't like to uh, hear that other people say that China doesn't have any uh, capability to, uh, to, to occupy Taiwan because uh, this kind of discourse uh, truly hurt uh, their, 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 uh, uh, their face uh, and also uh, this kind of discourse may embolden uh, the uh, pro-independence uh, forces in Taiwan. So anyway, uh, China will have to uh, uh, keep uh, pressure on Taiwan uh, by non-peaceful means. I think that this uh, is going to be uh, happening uh, and uh, uh, the the uh, la last year, uh, last month, uh, you know, military uh, uh, intimidation was just the beginning of Xi Jinping's you know uh, uh, approach to Taiwan. Uh, let me stop here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Matsuda Sensei. That's been very very helpful uh, as a frame framing of, of the situation. Thank you, especially for pointing out the salience of Taiwan's election in January twenty twenty four. Um, and the way in which that could play into uh, thinking and planning in the next year. But also, I think uh, also your point about the definition of, of the status quo is also a very salutary reminder uh, about um, how both sides uh, or how uh, look at this differently. So uh, we'll come in the questions, I'm sure, to some, some issues about uh, how Japan um, views this. And I, I'll definitely be interested in your views on that. But meanwhile, let's uh, switch to uh, Mayor Noens. And how do you see that from this from London, Mayor? Thank you, Bill. Um, and, and thank you to Matsuda-san for your excellent remarks. I think they paint a very accurate picture of what's happening across the strait and in uh, the sentiment in Taiwan at the moment as well. Um, so I've been asked to speak a little bit about Europe's response to Taiwan and how European capitals are viewing uh, what's happening around Taiwan at the moment I and mean, how this fits into a wider context of EU-Taiwan relations uh, of late. And what I would say first and foremost is that in response to Pelosi's trip uh, to Taiwan, European capitals actually made relatively mild and few political statements. I think only Lithuania directly supported Pelosi's trip and it was limited to the G7 and the European Union's high representative uh, and vice president, um, uh, Mr. Borrell, uh, who condemned China's military exercises. And that was pretty much the extent of it. Overall, I think European companies here uh, still determine quite a lot of uh, Taiwan policy um, and European companies at the end of the day are still highly invested in the Chinese market, even though uh, we've heard talks of decoupling over the last few years. Of course, um, not much of that has eventuated. And um, I think the private sector is instead of focusing on decoupling, looking at diversifying um, their supply chains, the supply chains uh, instead. And so I think politically, militarily, economically, European countries are very much still finding their footing with regards to balancing the relationships with Taiwan and with China. Now, when it comes to that economically, um, I think those, as I've said, fundamentally haven't changed in the past few decades. European countries, of course, have deep ties with the Chinese market, but they also, of course, have had growing and diversifying ties with Taiwan as well. Um, slowly diversifying their bilateral relationships economically um, away from just um, seeing Taiwan as a manufacturing hub, but also reply, relying on Taiwan heavily for its key node in uh, the supply chain uh, around advanced technological components such as semiconductor chips. So there is an interest in Europe about Taiwan, but I'd say that in the past, that's been a predominantly economic interest. Bilaterally, your relations between Europe and Taiwan in terms of 
political relations, of course, that followed a one China policy as determined by European capitals themselves. Um, though I would argue that these have diversified uh, uh, quietly over the last uh, decade or so. Taiwan's democracy, of course, over time has flourished and become one of the most liberal societies in East Asia, especially in the area of, um, for example, um, LB LBGTQ uh, uh, rights. Uh, this, of course, has stuck in stark contrast to President Xi uh, and his view of China and the increasingly authoritarian turn he has taken China over the last few years. And so European countries have increasingly seen uh, Taiwan as more of a like-minded partner. Now, I would argue, though, that European states today then, um, and the European Union as well, have uh, a more diversified portfolio in terms of their relationship with Taiwan. They look, for example, to Taiwan when it comes to the circular economy, when it comes to combating climate change, when it comes to social issues and norms and values, how to combat disinformation, uh, a wide plethora of different uh, topics, cybersecurity, cooperation even. But overall, as I said, European states and the European Union for uh, the most part have been wary and to some extent still are wary of balancing those economic ties between China and expanding economic ties and political ties with Taiwan. And so therefore, I think we've seen that real adherence to a one China policy that has been quite rigid uh, by European capitals in the past and has seen very little uh, overt movement in terms of shifting the definition thereof. Uh, thereof. I think Beijing has played a role in that, uh, often conflating perhaps purposely uh, the one China principle that it holds with the one China policy that European and other capitals hold. And so overall, I think um, Europeans have as well been wary of um, rocking the boat a little bit too much across the strait in their relations with China and Taiwan for fear also of um, threats by uh, Beijing of uh, potential economic coercion, which if you look at the data, have actually turned out to be more bark than bite. I think there has been a turning point of late uh, in terms of how European countries view and interact Taiwan. And I would say that this wasn't necessarily the, the Pelosi trip. I think this predates that and goes back to the COVID-19 pandemic. European countries, I think, have begun uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic to understand their vulnerabilities more clearly via -vis their heavy reliance in some areas on the Chinese and indeed also Taiwanese uh, supply chains. Um, secondly, China's response to COVID both at home in China, but also its subsequent harsh wolf warrior language directed at the West by Chinese diplomats in Europe has brought Chinese assertiveness and domestic authoritarianism and the consequences thereof really to light more clearly to, for the average European citizen. Thirdly, I would say that in certain countries like the United Kingdom, certainly what happened in Hong Kong, the crackdown on protests that we saw and the imposition of the national security law have also connected the British citizen more directly to uh, events that are taking place in East Asia. Um, I don't think this necessarily counts for Taiwan just yet, but this is a PR a question and a narrative question, uh, and also a question of um, how we convince our publics moving forward that Taiwan actually matters to them. That still is an ongoing uh, question. And last of all, of course, uh, add to all of these things, the, um, uh, the illegal and um, uh, detention of uh, Uyghurs in Xinjiang, and also, of course, China's stance to the war in Ukraine. And overall, you're seeing a whole new landscape in Europe evolve whereby uh, opinions of China, public opinions of China have never rated more low than they currently do. And so criticism of China is quite high. However, despite this, again, I go back to my earlier point, which is that despite this changed perception, we haven't yet seen um, substantive policy changes by European states to balance its political and economic interests when it comes to China and Taiwan. I would say that the vast minority of um, European countries have been proactive. Lithuania is an example in terms of uh, abandoning uh, a relation with Taiwan, uh, with China, and um, deepening uh, engagements with uh, Taiwan, although not diplomatic uh, di uh, diplomatic recognition, that would be a step too far. But of course, we have to remember that Lithuania had 
a very, very small uh, trade dependence on China in the first place to begin with. And so I don't think that necessarily, <clears throat> excuse me, Lithuania's example is one that's going to be replicated more broadly across the European continent. European parliaments, I think, have been particularly active uh, in terms of engaging with Taiwan more openly uh, and in, uh, more critically of China as well. And so we've seen the European Parliament send delegations to uh, Taiwan. The UK is also likely to send a House of Commons delegation in the next few months to Taipei as well. Um, but by and large, most European economies, I think, remain interested in um, deepening relations with Taiwan for quite practical reasons, um, whether they be related to the alliance with the United States or also, of course, uh, their dependence and their interest in Taiwan's chip manufacturing uh, capabilities uh, through largely um, China, uh, TSMC's monopoly in the area of uh, advanced semiconductor chips. Um, and the interest here, of course, is not just in helping Taiwan use this as a silicon shield, if that is a concept that we want to buy into, but also, of course, whether or not those capabilities can be offshored from Taiwan and onshored onto Europe. And so far, I think that is still a negotiation that's happening and taking place, although I would question how likely that actually is. Um, now that brings me to defense questions. And of course there was a defense, uh, I think a large condemnation of uh, the exercises that um, the PLA undertook around Taiwan following Pelosi's visit. Um, when it comes to European defense ties with uh, Taiwan though, I would say that these are still extremely sensitive and broadly off limits for most European, if not all European uh, governments. Um, questions of defense uh, with the uh, defense ties with Taiwan are limited to indirect ties between a very few small number of European companies with strengths in particular areas of defense production. Think, for example, of submarine technology. And second of all, European countries who have maintenance, ongoing maintenance contracts with Taiwan for older equipment and platforms that Taiwan still has in its inventory. Um, Taiwan still, at the end of the day, remains highly reliant on the United States for arms sales and transfers, as well as a, a deepened investment by the Thai administration over the last few years into Taiwan's indigenous capabilities. European capitals are behind the scenes thinking about what a Taiwan scenario might mean to them. Um, however, um, and whenever one might take place in the future, uh, discussions in European capitals, however, are, I think, um, starting to take shape around the role that Europe can play in uh, with regards to sanctions, should something ever happen, um, but also what might be expected of U.S. allies in the event of a Taiwan contingency. I think most European capitals uh, are uh, highly uh, cognizant of their resource limitations when it comes to a Taiwan contingency. And so most of these discussions are always going to take place in the context of how to support the United States in a Taiwan contingency rather than how to play a leading role in a Taiwan contingency, militarily speaking. In some cases, I think these discussions have been um, bilaterally uh, uh, discussed with the United States, but by and large, these are very, very nascent discussions that are taking place. So I don't think we should read too much into them uh, for the moment. We also, of course, need to uh, understand that um, for the moment, the prioritization uh, uh, with regards to European resources is going to be directed at European security at home and in its own region and backyard, um, rather than a Taiwan contingency. I think what we are starting to see um, has been helpful in some ways. It's helpful to understand uh, and to get some greater clarity on where European states uh, stand with regards to Taiwan and their policies with regards to Taiwan should a contingency occur. However, I would also warn and caution that some statements that have been made have been incredibly unhelpful. Take, for example, the now Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Liz Truss's statement that the UK should have started arming Taiwan a long time ago to help defend itself. Now, of course, that implied that the UK has already started arming Taiwan. Um, so I think at the end of the day, this is also a question about Europeans learning to uh, how to talk about Taiwan constructively in the open, uh, uh, in an open debate and um, uh, beyond uh, closed door settings in which they normally would take place. 
Ultimately, I think should a Taiwan contingency take place, and I'm of the view that this will be later rather than sooner, um, uh, fully accepting the pressures that are on President Xi Jinping uh, and that narrowing window of opportunity for peaceful reunification, I think certain um, uh, factors will determine Europe's response. Uh, the first, of course, is the domestic context in which Europe faces itself at the time. Secondly, the transatlantic relationship between the U.S. and Europe, and of course, the United States' initial response to a Taiwan contingency. Thirdly, uh, Europe's relationship with China and what the state is, fourthly, of Europe's tilt to the Indo-Pacific at that time when this eventually uh, may happen. And I think at the moment, none of these factors are certain, and all of these factors are still something that European capitals are discussing behind closed doors. And I'll leave it at that, though. Thank you very, very much, Claire. That's a wonderful uh, overview of the European stance and the European relationships and the European complexities, really, but also how, in some ways, how we're very much at the start of Europe thinking hard about this issue. I should have pointed out when I opened this that the reason that just across, over my shoulder here is the words double I double S or the letters double I double S is because I'm doing this um, webinar from the IISS Berlin office, because I happen to be in Berlin today. Um, it's not because I'm uh, wearing two hats at the same time. I'm wearing the Japan Society hat right now, but nevertheless, um, that's why it's behind my shoulder. Now, we've got some questions coming in, and I encourage other members of the audience to put in their questions. Before getting to the, the questions that are in, though, I want to just ask both of you um, if you could in addition to what you've already said about the relations between China and Taiwan, just give your sense of what impact, if any, does as it were, the economic and political strength of China at any given moment make in its calculations and in the relationship with Taiwan? I ask this question because at the moment, clearly China is in a difficult economic situation with post-COVID, uh, zero-COVID policy with its property difficulties uh, as well and suffering the energy crisis um, like the rest of us. Um, does does the up, Do the ups and downs of China's strength or weakness economically play a role at all in thinking about Taiwan? Or should we just consider this being to be, as it were, uh, seasonally adjusted um, independent issue of uh, of economic strength or, or otherwise. Matsuda Sensei, what's your um, attitude to Chinese strength or not? Uh, which comes down to the question of whether time is on China's side. Well, um, that's a very good question. There are uh, two uh, different views on this issue. One is a diversionary war theory. Uh, when uh, the country is in a very difficult situation, especially in the domestic field, uh, the dictatorial government uh, tends to uh, resort uh, to a kind of a, 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 um, a military action uh, to others and try to divert uh, divert uh, the, ten uh, the, the uh, tension from domestic to the, to the outside. Um, that, that's one theory. The other uh, theory is much more uh, reactionary uh, theory. That's, uh, you know, uh, the people like uh, Taylor Fravel in MIT in the United States uh, insist that uh, China uh, tends to take uh, very strong measures when China thinks that uh, uh, she is pushed by others, you know. In the uh, you know uh, if U.S. push too much, you know China uh, may take a very extreme uh, uh, in a position. Um, so uh, it depends on uh, you know Xi Jinping. Uh, Xi Jinping's uh, psychology is very uh, important, and uh, he is now running for the third term. And uh, usually China's reaction uh, could be. Uh, much uh, um, more, um, you know, uh, 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 a kind of a, a usual uh, uh, exercise in the theory. But Xi Jinping is a very uh, uh, special uh, personality. 
and he uh, is really devoted uh, to uh, um, achieve his, his political goal, and he he did it in Hong Kong, and he thinks that that is that is a successful case, you know. So um, I think that uh, if he only has uh, five years. Um, or uh, maybe 10 years, I think that um, he will try very hard to actually, you know, solve the problem. You know, that's the full, invas uh, full invasion or um, before that he will take, uh, 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 he ma makes an effort to, uh, you know, let uh, Taiwan surrender, you know, uh, so, so without killing anyone, he can uh, merge Taiwan. But he, if he fails, uh, uh, you know, use the force. I think that this kind of uh, um, th this this is not just um, you know uh, a matter of uh, his surroundings. This is a matter of a political will, and the China is a very big economy, uh, so um, uh, arbitrarily uh, China can. Uh, um, you know, pour more resources to the military side. You know, uh, ICBMs are very cheap. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> vessels are very cheap. So I, I think that uh, this kind of uh, policy choice uh, can be made. I think that uh, China, uh, no matter what happens in the economic side, will uh, build up more uh, military, uh, especially in the, uh, the field of nuclear weapons, and uh, try to uh, uh, you know, prevent U.S. from intervening uh, in in the Taiwan Strait uh, situation. So I think that it's a kind of due course. Uh, okay. Uh, well, thank you. No, that that that's that's helpful. Mayor, how do you think about this? You you said that you think that this contingency is further ahead rather than nearer. That perhaps implies part of your answer, but that means once. China is a more aging society like Japan. Um, so does this make any difference? So I think actually um, the reason I said that is because I look at the PLA and its modernization on a day-to-day -day basis. And the first thing I would like to say, of course, is I completely agree that capability does not equal political will. So China could have all the capability in the world and still not decide not to uh, 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 take uh, military action to force reunification as they see it. Um, but what I would say is that with regards to the PLA uh, and their modernization goal of 2035 is that there is still quite a lot that needs to be done at home in order for those forces to be combat ready and for Beijing to be 110, if not 120 percent sure that success is guaranteed. Uh, because ultimately, if this were a battle against just Taiwan, probably they'd be a lot more confident. But at the end of the day, regardless of, for example, America's strategic ambiguity position, this in the mind of the PLA, in the mind of Central Military Commission's leadership, uh, is always going to be a battle between the United States and China over Taiwan. And now perhaps potentially in the worst case scenario, the United States and Japan and potentially like-minded uh, militaries as well. So it's suddenly becoming a lot more complex and the PLA's modernization has not achieved what it needs to achieve by that deadline. Um, and I would just on that like to explain perhaps for audiences who don't look at this on a day to day basis that we see a lot of really impressive change within the PLA. We see, you know, fifth generation aircraft, we see aircraft carriers, submarine capabilities, which are incre increasingly advanced. But what I'm talking about here is really that connective uh, softer element of uh, modernization that has to do with personnel, which has to do with training, um, doctrine, strategy. Um, integrated joint operations, all of these things that are extremely, extremely difficult to do for our militaries uh, if you're thinking about a modern great on great power uh, war, but on the other hand are even more difficult for a military that has been so heavily siloed uh, in the past and so land focused and now needs to be air, maritime, space and cyber focused. So there's a lot that needs to be done in a very short amount of time if we want to see, if, if, if China would like to see forced reunification be successful in the near term future. That doesn't of course mean that a, a decision can't be taken to reunify Taiwan by force should uh, Beijing feel uh, the need to do so. And there are certain things that I think will make that um, uh, uh, more clear. Uh, certainly there are red lines from Xi's perspective. I think if Taiwan declared 
uh, independence tomorrow, well, then I think there would be very little choice left for the PLA not to intervene. Um, but short of that, I think, you know, how uh, what type of weapons Taiwan acquires in the next uh, uh, five to 10 years will be important, how they seek to uh, help Taiwan bolster its defenses and perhaps even more offensive capabilities. I think all of these things will will tip the balance one way or another in terms of feeling the need to act before necessary. At the end of the day, I would like to emphasize that for Chinese decision making, and though we cannot understand and we cannot know what uh, President Xi is thinking, and he is the only one that will be making this decision, um, I think it is uh, certain that over the past few years through his leadership, he has emphasized how much of a core issue Taiwan is for not just him uh, or the PRC, but for the CCP itself. And so not achieving this goal, but even worse, trying to achieve this goal and failing would be an existential problem for the CCP. And so hence my initial assessment that for military reasons, but also for political reasons within China, this is going to be something that isn't left to opportunism because the rest of the world is focused on Ukraine. We saw that that didn't happen. This isn't going to be left to a moment of instability to redirect attention outside uh, of China, uh, away from the party. Um, we didn't see that during COVID. Um, and I think it's not something that's going to be left to a whim at the end of the day. It's something that is going to be considered. And if I may, just very, very lastly, I actually think that the exercises that, that were undertaken following Pelosi's trip were extremely considered from uh, the Chinese perspective in terms of the weapons they used, in terms of what they chose not to use, and, uh, and also in terms of the types of exercises that they conducted as well. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, Matsuda Sensei, you're waving. So, um... Well, um, there's a inter in very interesting phenomenon. Uh, if you are a, uh, a very uh, an excellent uh, China watcher, you will see that PLA is just a paper tiger. You know, it can fight. Um, but if you are a very uh, a good uh, Taiwan expert and uh, Taiwanese uh, uh, military is also a paper tiger. It can't defend itself. And if you are a true expert on the United States, uh, no, uh, you, you will never believe that the US would intervene in the Taiwan Strait crisis. So, um, you know, because US uh, is so divided and, uh, uh, you know, US doesn't want to fight a, a war with, with China. Uh, but something may occur. You know, I think that this is the that that the real world, and uh, we should not be fall into the the, the pitfall of experts. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is this is not a joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but I, your point that uh, the, the the possibility you've got a, basically a triangular relationship. Number one, and secondly, the chances of a calculation being based on both what's happening with you, but also what's happening on the other sides of the triangle is, of course fundamental um, to the issue. Now, I've got some questions in, and I'm going to come to two questions about Japan, um, because I think we should uh, bring in the Japanese element. Um, Duncan Bartlett, who's from uh, the SOAS, School of Oriental African Studies, uh, China Institute, um, talks about, point, points out that Japan has recently changed defense ministers from Kishi-san to Hamada-san, um, how do you, Matsuda Sensei, how do you see the political situation in Tokyo in relation to China and Taiwan? And a connected question comes from Martin Hatful, Deputy Chair of the Japan Society, asks, how strong is Japanese public support for Taiwan? If China started building pressure, would on Taiwan, would a majority of Japanese voters expect Japan's government to provide practical support to Taiwan or not? How do you think about those two questions together. Thank you for very good questions. I think that uh, the Japanese uh, public is really, really worried about uh, uh, the possibility of China's attack on Taiwan. Uh, in some uh, opinion polls, more than 90% of the Japanese public uh, are worried about that. And uh, this is even more uh, true uh, after the Ukraine war. Uh, because, you know, a lot of people simply thought that it would never happen, but it happened, you know, the, and we have witnessed that uh, uh, 
uh, President Putin's, uh, you know, behavior and his, uh, uh, you know, uh, words and, and, and attitudes. And uh, the, we, the people uh, simply feel that uh, everything is upside down. Uh, true becomes lie and lie becomes truth. And uh, the Japanese public also feel the similar uh, uh, thing uh, in China. So, um, you know, the Japanese people have uh, many year, uh, um, you know, uh, engagement with, uh, with the Chinese and uh, uh, the people are really wor wor worrisome. And also more than 70% of the uh, Japanese public uh, think that Japan should do something uh, to stabilize uh, the situation in uh, the, uh, the Taiwan Strait. I think this is, this is, this is a very extremely high number uh, because in, in Japan, uh, the international uh, affairs are not the focus, basically. You know, more than 90% or 70% of the people are worried. But the, the reality is that uh, the Japan's policy framework is that uh, without US direct in intervention, Japan cannot do uh, much things, uh, just sending uh, aircrafts and vessels and uh, gather information and share with the United States and so on. Once US decides to intervene uh, into the situation, Japan, you know, of course, Japan can uh, assist US forces, uh, uh, that including, uh, uh, you know, live ammunition and fuels and, and so on. Um, but not weapons, you know, that's the, the Japanese, uh, you know, uh, uh, restriction. But, you know, the, the basic, uh, you know, situation is Japan doesn't have a policy framework to do something uh, alone. You know, Japan can do something, but only with uh, the United States. Uh, and that, that's uh, the current situation. So the Japan's actual role is very limited, uh, but, you know, the people are really worried about the current situation. Ah, Thank you. Minute, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the Kishida prime minister changed the, uh, the defense ministers. And he also changed the, the um, vice minister of, of the, uh, defense, uh, uh, executive vice minister of, uh, of the defense. And also he, he changed the personnel of the director of the uh, defense, uh, 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 defense in, inside uh, the Ministry of Defense. I think that um, Kishida wanted to be more independent uh, from the influence of uh, Abe. Suga, Abe and Suga administration. Uh, but uh, this is uh, a little bit surprising, uh, uh, you know, uh, move because uh, uh, the Ministry of Defense is going to uh, uh, draft three uh, strategic documents this year and also uh, uh, going to increase uh, the defense budget in a fundamental way. And this is a quite tough situation for all the personnel in the Ministry of Defense. And the top leaders, uh, very important leaders, were, were removed. Um, it's a big, big challenge for the Ministry of Defense. Thank you. Thank you. And may I, I mean, you follow the region very closely. Um, uh, Simon Shelton, who's a consultant for the defense industry, um, asks also about what impact Russia Ukraine is having on attitudes to Taiwan within the Northeast Asian region. I know you're about to go to Singapore, but um, and therefore perhaps we should ask you next week. But this, what's your um, sense uh, of, of uh, how other countries in the region have reacted and what their view is of uh, the Taiwan situation? So I think countries in not just Northeast Asia, but wider Asia have taken some interesting um, stances with regards to how they responded to Ukraine and, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, Singapore notably, um, you know, stepped away and some other countries stepped away from their long held kind of neutral position uh, and made some uh, statements that were actually a little more aligned with uh, the West's response. Um, when it comes to Taiwan, however, and I will have a more updated uh, view on this uh, in two weeks time when I return, but from my discussions throughout this year, and this will be my fourth trip to Singapore this year, um, I would argue that most see the likelihood of a war across the Taiwan Strait as um, a, a lot lower than, than how we view it in Europe. It seems to be more 
stable. Now, I, I understand that um, from Japan's perspective, that's different. Japan faces different pressures uh, and is right on uh, the receiving end of Chinese assertiveness, military assertiveness more directly, uh, and of course, closer to Taiwan. But I would say that in Southeast Asia, for example, uh, when I speak to interlocutors, they still view this as a rational decision that President Xi will make at some point in the distant future, rather than uh, a rash decision that will be made in the near-term future. Thank you. No, that that uh, makes make, makes a lot of sense. Let me um, move uh, to these questions about um, as it were, what a coercive peaceful unification might look like. What should we be expecting short of as it were, shock and awe type military uh, action? Um, we've got a question um, from an anonymous attendee, but anyway, um, asking about does China really need full spectrum joint arms invasion capacity or really just enough scare tactics to enforce a blockade for you a few weeks? It's hard to imagine the US and later Japan attempting to conduct the modern version of the Berlin airlift, which is uh, a fair point, um, which, and perhaps a lesson or a, a surprise with Ukraine was that um, President Putin gave up his, in effect, salami tactics and went for um, a, a once and for all invasion, which has now been seen to fail. How, what form do you think progressive intimidation of Taiwan uh, would look like and how would others respond to it? Perhaps may I start with you and then back to the sensei. Sure, I think it's an excellent question. Um, I think when it comes to salami slicing tactics or uh, tactics just short of war, we often talk about a couple of things and that is um, uh, the um, takeover or uh, assertiveness uh, or declaration of, of control over um, Taiwan's smaller islands first, uh, in order to then show that um, inevitable uh, reunification, that reunification is inevitable. Alternatively, uh, there's a question of whether or not China is able to economically dislocate um, Taiwan from the rest of uh, the Indo-Pacific, um, so isolate Taiwan economically through, for example, increasingly uh, sign um, uh, its own uh, bilateral or minilateral or multilateral uh, trade initiatives. Um, so I think that question arose particularly after RCEP. Um, uh, I think third of all, people quickly turn to the question of a naval or an aerial blockade. We have to remember that those under international law are acts of war, even though kinetic activity might not be uh, involved. And so I wouldn't necessarily count that as um, uh, under the threshold of warfare. In the event of, I think, um, both um, taking smaller islands or enacting a blockade of some sort. The PLA isn't going to be doing this without being prepared for a full-scale invasion, because ultimately these are about testing the United States and other allies' responses, and indeed Taiwan's response. That test can fail. And so from Beijing's perspective, undertaking those without being completely prepared for uh, a possibility of uh, a, a full-scale war uh, would be uh, extremely risky, and therefore, I think it's, it, I think it's difficult for us um, to uh, separate these um, these types of actions uh, uh, from a full scale invasion. I think we need to see them as a continuum. I think we need to see them as interconnected, uh, and therefore, we need to be prepared for all eventualities, not just limited ones. Thank you. Very interesting, um, Matsuda Sensei. What, how do you see this? Yeah, um, I totally agree with uh, uh, Neya. You know, um, there are many versions of use of force, but we have to think uh, clearly that, full, uh, for example, first, full invasion is very difficult. Uh, um, you know, China doesn't have a capability to accomplish it. Uh, uh, especially that's, that's true if there is a, a risk of a US intervention. And uh, the limited uh, use of force, well, yes, China has that capability, but what for? What is the purpose uh, to do that? Taking over uh, Itu Aba in the South China Sea? Uh, well, uh, by doing that, maybe it will um, uh, trigger uh, a very negative reactions from the Southeast Asian nations. 
and also you know uh, Taiwan and the rest of the uh, world may take it as the the first step of uh, military uh, full invasion to Taiwan and uh, the rest of the world will have to prepare for that so um it's not a good idea for for China to to take a limited um uh, actual use of force uh rather uh China tends to uh, use force uh, without uh, making any casualties and also without making any changes of the borders. That's, that's a kind of a military operations uh, um, of um, uh, military provocation type uh, uh, operations. That has been done for many times, you know, and, and this time is also or, or can be categorized as the military provocation. And uh, if uh, this kind of uh, you know, uh, provocation doesn't make any casualties and doesn't make any changes of the borders, uh, Taiwan and the United States will remain very calm uh, and will, they will not choose escalation. So China's political uh, 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 you know, purpose can be achieved. That is, for example, this time, the, uh, the, uh, the major political purpose of uh, China was to show domestic audience that uh, you know U.S. is doing very wrong thing, and we have punished them. You know, both uh, United States and Taiwan. Uh, so, so you know, uh, the Xi Jinping is um, a legitimate leader. Uh, he is a very tough uh, leader. I, I think that um, there are many uh, purposes of the uh, the military maneuvers, but. This is the uh, uh, major uh, purpose, domestic purpose, and that, that is quite, quite, uh, quite effective. Uh, that's why the military, uh, you know, exercise was done during the Beitaihe uh, conference and right before or the uh, party congress uh, in the, the next month. Uh, yeah. So the still China's in this uh, stage, only doing uh, some military intimidation. Don't, don't dare to actually, uh, you know, uh, use force and kill people and change the border. And a few seconds left. Um, maybe I could just finish by asking there, uh, which links on from what Matilda Sensei has just come. I mean, John Nash asked, how secure is Xi Jinping's position in Beijing? Um, uh, which is to say, to what degree, insofar as we know about Chinese politics, um, what what should we be looking at and looking for in trying to um, at least map, um, as it were, the, 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 the changing tides in, in, in China itself? Oh, yeah, the million dollar question. Um, I, I think, honestly, um, from what I've seen, um, President Xi is in a very strong position at home. That does not mean that criticism does not exist. Uh, uh, that criticism is directed at policies rather than directly at him. Um, and I think um, that by and large, uh, he is uh, going to enter his third term with some real domestic difficulties, but not necessarily uh, a, um, a, an unstable uh, political leadership or, or his or unstable control over uh, China, politically speaking. I think what would be interesting to see uh, following the 20th Party Congress, of course, is who's in and who's out of the uh, Politburo Standing Committee and Central Committee to see uh, who he replaces some key allies who might be retiring with, and even some former key allies who um, have been increasingly outspoken on some of the poly policy issues that he's, uh, that he's um, championed. And so I think that will be an indication, again, of, of, of how uh, stable he will be in the next five years moving through his uh, third term. Um, lastly, when you want to look at how stable President Xi is and you want to understand the political landscape in China, look at where blame is being directed. Um, uh, I think that really can't be underestimated. Uh, what we've seen throughout the last two and a half years, uh, almost three years of COVID uh, crises in China and economic crises is that often more a different figurehead in the government is pushed out into the public domain to take the blame for certain failures. Um, when that starts to change, then his political control, I think, will be uh, slightly weakened and it will be an indication, I think, of, of, of what we see. Second of all, and very important for Taiwan, is 
how in line the PLA is with um, uh, what we're hearing from uh, leadership, uh, civilian leadership. So far, the two are aligned in the PLA is uh, by and large um, following civilian uh, leadership control. When you start hearing different voices, that's when we should also be concerned, I think. Thank you. Very good bellwethers um, and an excellent way to finish this uh, very, very stimulating discussion. Um, I thank you both very warmly for taking the time to be with us. Um, I wish uh, you good travels to uh, back to Singapore and to Taipei, Mayor. I wish you um, a, a good week uh, of teaching in Hokkaido and hope to see you in Tokyo, uh, Matsuda Sensei, before long. And I thank um, the audience very much for some excellent questions. Um, and for your support for the Japan Society. Um, so with that, thank you all. And uh, we'll look forward to this, following this extremely important issue in future events, I'm sure. Thank you very much to you both.